Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today I'm pleased to welcome an author who writes books with a specific focus for adolescents, teens and young adults. The focus is to provide support for LGBTQ kids so they can avoid stigma, bigotry and social isolation. He's written two books, a novel entitled Queer as a $5 Bill about a teenager's coming out and coming of age and a book entitled No Way They're Gay, Hidden Lives and Secret Loves which provides compelling evidence that some of the most iconic people in history were secretly gay or bisexual. He wants to empower young people to embrace and celebrate and be proud of who they are. And his audience is immense. His blog has a following of over 3 million people. His name is Lee Wind. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. I was uh, laughing that uh, even if this wasn't a podcast, if it was just a, a dinner party conversation, I was so excited to get to talk to you because I'm so, I think you're part of our, our recent history as a queer community, but accessing our, the fact that we have more history than that is so exciting. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, Lee, when I discovered your books and your website, which is leewind.org, I couldn't help wondering how different my teenage years would have been if I'd only had access to the resources you're providing to young people today. I was a teenager in the 70s, and I truly believed that I was the only person out there who was like me. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I joke that if only I had a time machine to go back and give my books to myself, it would have changed my entire life. Tell us a bit about your coming out process. I understand you were in your mid-20s when you came out. Yeah, my, my coming out process was horrible. I actually remember the, the moment I went into the closet. I was 11 years old, my family was in New York City, and uh, we went down to the village to some like ice cream shop or something. And it was I, like, there was like a rainbow in the window, but I didn't know what a rainbow meant at that time. And there were two young 20 somethings behind the counter. One was a, a, a woman in like, leather pants and a black leather bra and a whip by her side. And there, there was a guy with no shirt and a harness. and and uh, je uh, ripped jeans and, and he was like everything I would ever have hoped for in my fantasy. Like I just was so gobsmacked by how beautiful he was. And I was just speechless. and I couldn't even like say what I wanted. And I just remember being so tongue tied and then like floating, like euphoric because he was the one that gave me my ice cream. And then we were walking out and we were like a block, not even a block away. And my whole family started laughing. Uh, like we had just visited like freakish creatures in the zoo. And uh, can you believe that? How crazy? And I just knew like if I let them know that the one I thought was so beautiful was the guy that I, I could lose everything. And I, I also felt like you, like I was the only person in the entire world that, that was a guy that liked, liked other guys. And it was... You know, so from, from 11 years old, from that moment through to being really 21 to admit it to myself and then slowly coming out to friends at where I felt safe. And then finally, I was 25 when I came out to my parents. Um, it was just a long, long journey. So I look at those 14 years and I think pretty much everything I do in my life as an adult, especially as an author is uh, and a blogger is how can I help make the world a safer place for kids today so they don't have to waste all that time? Because I really want kids to be able to be their authentic selves now. And I want us to get, as a, as a, as a society, I want us to get to where we're not tolerating people who are different, where we're celebrating it. How do teens today do that themselves and how do we adults support them? Well, let's talk about your first book, Queer is a $5 Bill. Lee, I absolutely loved it. And to our viewers, I say this, for anyone who has ever been bullied or who's ever felt invisible for any reason, this book is a must read. Lee, what I loved about your book is that in addition to being an intelligent, uplifting and thought provoking narrative, there's the added bonus of the amazing research you did on the actual historic material that triggers all of the events in the novel. How did you come up with the idea for this book? As a gay man, I was sort of scrambling to relive my teenage years in a more authentic way. 
right? Like a lot of us have this sort of like delayed adolescence because the first time through we're doing it like acting. And then, then we're, I came out at 25 fully. And then it was like, oh, you know what? I kind of need to do some things that I never had a chance to do. So I went on a weekend camp for gay men and they had lectures and they had talks and they had like heart circles in the forest. And it was really cool because one of the lectures a uh, gentleman spoke about the the real life historical letters that Abraham Lincoln wrote Joshua Fry Speed that convinced him that Abraham was in love with Joshua. And I was like, what? That that cannot possibly be true. But I couldn't get it out of my mind. So when I got back home, I went to the library and I got out this very slim book. It was about Joshua Fry Speed, uh, Abraham Lincoln's most intimate friend. And it, they'd only ever published 250 copies of it. And somehow the Los Angeles library had one of them. And it not only had a, a sort of, Joshua Fry Speed had been Lincoln's best friend and or very close friend or maybe lover, but it had all the letters that, it, that survived history. And um, mostly the letters Abraham wrote Joshua because the letters Joshua wrote Abraham were destroyed by Mary. So Abraham and Lincoln, when you look at the historical record, they lived together for four years. They shared a bed. At, we're not playing CSI history. It isn't like, can you give me DNA proof that they had sex? It's more about, can we look at the primary source materials and figure out, did they love each other? And when you look at the letters, uh, after four years of living together, Joshua moves back to Kentucky and marries this woman named Fanny. And uh, Abraham, eight months later, sends him a letter and says, are you now in feeling as well as judgment glad that you're married as you are. For many but me, this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated, but I know you'll tolerate it for me. Please tell me quickly, I feel very impatient to know. We don't have the answer, but we do know it was only three weeks later that Abraham married Mary Todd. And I read that and I got goosebumps. I was like, oh my gosh, this is a reflection of me in history. That is exactly how I felt. I judged it, but I didn't feel it. And suddenly it was like, you know, the, the heavenly choir. I was like, oh my gosh, there's someone queer in history like me. And I was just, I became obsessed with the research and reading all the letters and really looking at like, what were the, what was the evidence? And I was like, you know, I, I thought about the time machine and then I was like, yeah, I don't have a time machine. But then I was like, well, I'm a writer. Why don't I write this as a story? And that's where the idea for Queers of Five Dollar Bill came from. I, I wanted to write it as a, a story about a, a closeted kid today who finds this out about Lincoln and Lincoln in America is so idolized and, He's convinced that if he can tell the world that Abraham Lincoln was in love with another guy, because he actually is assigned a book report on Lincoln, and he gets that very same book that, that was only 250 copies ever made. He gets that very same book given to him by the librarian to do his book report. And he is thumbing through it, and he finds the same letter I did, and he gets the same goosebump moment. And that was, that was why I thought to write that book, because the idea that you could like out Lincoln on a blog and change the entire world is so compelling but of course, I think if that did happen, it would just explode in a giant conservative backlash and media firestorm, which is exactly what happens in the book. Can I ask you, do you know whether this book by Robert Kincaid, it's entitled Joshua Fry Speed, Lincoln's Most Intimate Friend. Is that book still available? Um, I mean, it's it's way out of print, but my library does have, um, I, actually, I worked with the Los Angeles Public Library to make it so they wouldn't lose that copy. And they ended up making it a reference material, which I thought made it a little safer. So it wouldn't just like get borrowed and then lost. But the crazy thing is, is that there are a lot of other places that these letters from Abraham to Joshua exist and have been printed. So let me ask you about your book. There are three overlapping themes or stories in the book. Wyatt, who is the main character, he's coming to terms with his sexual identity. There's his book report blog and the impact of the blog on the community. I know your target audience for the book is young people, but I have to tell you, Lee, I found the book really compelling and very moving. Is there any thought to making that book into a movie? I would love that. That would be amazing. We did do an audiobook version of it with Michael Crouch as the narrator, and he does the most incredible job. I think I write in a way that is cinematic, but I don't know if it I don't know. It hasn't, it hasn't, but if there's a producer listening to this, you know, get in touch. <laughs> Lee, I noticed that when you write the word gay, you use a capital G. Some gay people feel that by capitalizing the word gay, we are labeling the person and making the fact that they're gay, the predominant part of their identity. Whereas if you use the small G, 
you're making it clear that being gay is only part of who they are. Do you see a distinction between capitalizing and not capitalizing the word gay? I think words have so much power. I actually went back and forth with the new publisher of the new nonfiction book about this because they chose not to capitalize gay or lesbian or bi or trans or intersex or asexual. And I disagree with respect. I, I was not thrilled with that decision, but it was okay. I could live with it because they were more concerned about sort of being grammatically correct. But I think that grammar shifts over time, language shifts over time. And, you know, when I have control, like on my blog or in the book that I published, I, I do capitalize and give respect to, to everybody, to all the colors of the rainbow, because I really feel like, why are we only doing it for some and not for others? So yeah, I think words really matter. And just as a tangential thing to this, it makes me think of the word homosexual and how I don't think that helps queer people. And I think that if we, it, I think for straight people, they think about queer people and they think about how we have sex. And I think we would do much better if we focused on love and that the love between me and my husband and our teenage daughter, what, what holds us together as a family, that glue is love. And that's the same love that holds everybody else's family together. And I think that if the word were homo lovable, if we changed the focus from sex to love, we would be having a much different cultural conversation. I mean, just imagine, Harvey, if it was homo lovable history, if it was homo lovable rights, if it was homo lovable marriage, we would be having different conversations. Words are powerful. It's a thought. I've never considered <laughs> that. My little campaign. Your second book is nonfiction. It's called No Way They Were Gay, Hidden Lives and Secret Loves. And it's an extremely well-researched book that provides very persuasive evidence, I must say, that some of the most famous people in history, people like Abraham Lincoln and Mahatma Gandhi and even Shakespeare may in fact have been gay or bisexual. What inspired you to write that book? It was actually writing the first book. It was writing the novel. As I was working on Queer as a $5 Bill, so much evidence came up about Abraham Lincoln and Joshua Fry Speed. And I literally couldn't figure out how to get it all in the book. And I thought, well, should I do like a big end note section? And then I was like, well, wait, maybe this is a nonfiction book. But I don't know about you, but when, when history was taught in school to me, it was taught like medicine. It was like names and dates to memorize. And it was, it never reflected anyone like me. And I just was so disconnected from it and uninterested in it. And I, the thought of doing an entire history book about Abraham Lincoln and Joshua Price Speed, even though they were two guys in love, kind of bored me. And I don't want to be boring. I, I want to be, I want history to be like, like chocolate. I want it to be fascinating and interesting. And for me, the story of Abraham and Joshua was sort of like the first crack in the false facade of history. And it got me really into almost like collecting these stories from history, these people that are sort of surprising that, that we don't really know about, like Eleanor Roosevelt, that she was in love with this other woman, Lorena Hickok, and that they had this decades long relationship and there are found literally thousands of letters between them. And Eleanor wore this diamond and sapphire ring that like, like a wedding ring, like she wore this ring that Lorena had given her. And it's like so romantic. And yet at the same time, Eleanor was, you know, first lady of the United States. I just got so excited and I thought, well, maybe a book about that, about not about a, just Abraham and Joshua, but maybe if it's a book about that false facade of history and how really there were men who loved men and women who loved women and people who loved without regard to gender and then people who lived outside gender boundaries across time and around our world. And I got really excited because that was a book I was really into doing. And, and that's what No Way They Were Gay became. And really so much of it is about like, let's put aside the hundreds of years of historians that deny this. And let's go back to the primary source materials and let's let these people, let's hear their voices. Let's let them speak for themselves. Hearing Eleanor and Lorena speaking to each other through these letters, reading the love contract between Gandhi and the man that he loved, Herman Kallenbach, I'm, it just, I kept getting blown away by it. And so that's what I tried to get in the book. So Lee, what do you say to people who accuse you of making unfounded allegations without convincing proof? Well, again, I think it's like we're not playing CSI history. Like when people are like, should prove it, 
I think they're talking about like, you know, prove who had sex with whom. And I think that that doesn't, it's not even an interesting question for me. It's who was in love with whom? And we do have proof. And I'm very transparent in the book. I'm like, yeah, most historians totally don't agree with me. But here's what I think. And let's look at the letters. Let's look at this love contract between Gandhi and, and Herman Kallenbach. Let's read the letters together. And I, I really love the idea of being able to share the, the materials and then kind of also explain things, or at least how I see things. Ultimately, it's everybody's decision to make whether they, what they believe. Like my goal is not to convince people that I'm right and they're wrong. My goal is just to shine a light on this amazing history and let people decide themselves. Well, I love that the people you chose to profile span different eras, different countries and cultures and degrees of prominence. By doing that, I think you're showing that basically people are people no matter where or when they lived. Yeah, and, and the fact that they're just like us, right? I think that especially for young people, but for, for our, our inner teens as well, to know that we're not the first people on the planet that felt the way we did. I think about like the Pharaoh Hatshepsut, who in like over 2000 years ago in Egypt, literally over 22 years shifted how they presented their gender. They started out, they were presented as the daughter of the previous pharaoh, the, the, the widow of the previous pharaoh, and, and the regent to their two-year-old nephew. And then seven years in, they became senior co-king, not queen, but king of Egypt. And there was a shift in how the statues and the hieroglyphics portrayed Hatshepsut. And suddenly they were more masculine and they, they were, weren't wearing women's clothes anymore. They were dressed in, in female, uh, sorry, in male attire with a bare chest. They still had breasts, but it was kind of shifting slowly. And then at, towards the end of their reign, they were presented completely as a man, completely masculine, false beard, squared shoulders, you know, pecs. Like it was this remarkable two, over two generations, that, excuse me, two decades, this shift in how they presented their gender. And I think about how powerful that would be for a gender fluid or gender queer kid today to know that gender fluidity is not new. It isn't something that, that just happened. You know, even in the queer community, we talk a lot about Stonewall and how like, oh, this is where queer pride began. Well, okay, nothing against Stonewall. And I, I am so grateful for the drag queens that stood up and finally, you know, it was like enough is enough. But actually, we got to go back a little further to find out where pride began. There's a very important quote in the book. You say, and I'm quoting you here, history was crafted by people who recorded. History has been sanitized for the protection of people in power. Your example of what happened to the contents of the Hirschfeld Institute in Berlin at the hands of the Nazis is a dramatic illustration of the point you're making, isn't it? I got goosebumps at the time I discovered it, and I got goosebumps when you just said it uh, right now. I, the fact that that famous, I'm Jewish, and the fact that that famous moment in sort of like anti-Semitic history actually was also this destruction of an entire library of thousands of volumes of queer history and queer writings. I had no idea. I, this is this insidious thing that happens is that we are robbed of our true history piece by piece. And then we, every new generation thinks, oh my gosh, I'm the first one to ever feel this way. But we've been removed from history and very intentionally so. We, we get written out of history and I guess I'm trying to write us back into history. You've mentioned Mahatma Gandhi, who had a love contract with another man. You've talked about Abraham Lincoln, and you've also mentioned William Shakespeare. Can you briefly tell us what the evidence is to lead you to conclude that William Shakespeare was not exclusively heterosexual? Yeah, so Shakespeare had these love sonnets that he wrote and they ended up getting published. It's a debate in history whether he wanted them published or he didn't want them published, but 126 of these 150 some love sonnets are written to another man. And some of them are incredibly explicitly about his love for both a man and a woman. And what's so crazy is that it's another thing that gets written out of history. You know, sonnet 144 starts out, Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which like two spirits do suggest me still. The better angel is a man right fair, the worser spirit a woman colored ill. 
I mean, that's pretty clear that he's saying that he was in love with a guy and in love with a woman. Now, having said that, there are a lot of historians that say, oh, yeah, but the, the, the sonnets aren't really about, they were fiction. He was just writing characters. Okay, that, that, that is totally one interpretation. I, I read the sonnets and I feel like they're this heart-wrenching exploration of how he felt. But look at the laws of the time. You know, it wasn't cool to be an openly gay person in, in the time that Shakespeare was living in England. In fact, you could actually, a lot of bad things could happen. So I feel like it's really important to have context, uh, which I try to provide, but also to listen. I mean, if we, if we listen, I think like the reason that I was able to look at those letters from Abraham to Joshua, because I was gay, because I felt exactly the way that Abraham felt, it gave me an understanding of those letters different than maybe a straight historian might have had. And I think that if we listen with, truly listen, we can, we can hear so much. And, and it's more than just the stories of men who loved men. I mean, the stories of women who loved women are even harder to find because we've done so much uh, over, over the centuries to really erase women's contributions. So that was a real challenge in the book. It was trying to, to find what were, the, what were the stories that we have to listen harder to. Of all the people you wrote about, whose private life shocked you the most? I was really moved discovering the story of Mempo Nathonia. Unlike a lot of other people in the book, Mempo wasn't famous, or at least not in, in, world, in a worldwide kind of way. But to discover that the autobiography of this woman who lived in Lesotho, who was married to a man, but that wasn't really the primary emotional relationship of, of her life. In the 1950s, her relationship with another woman was celebrated by her community, including her husband and the other woman's husband. And it was like a wedding. It is described by her in her own words as like a wedding. Things don't go well with the first woman and they break up and years later she meets an American who helps her write her autobiography and they too have a romantic relationship but by this time homophobia has spread across Lesotho to such an extent that Mempo has to be feels like they have to be closeted like she has to be closeted about her relationship with Kendall and it's heart-wrenching and I found like it was so important because here was this woman that actually managed to publish an autobiography about her life. She wasn't rich, but she was rich. I mean, she wasn't rich in our, in our financial sense, but the fact that she gives us access to the fact that queerness is not brand new. And what, what maybe is, you know, and there's a lot of talk, especially in terms of looking at Africa and you look at Uganda and, and Mugabe and, Homophobia is the Western import. You know, men loving men and women loving women is natural. And in fact, there's a beautiful quote by Kendall that it's as, as natural as the air um, and the soil in Africa itself. So learning that, it really helped me open my eyes and recognize that like, wow, we have to listen harder, especially the stories of women, especially the stories of women of color. Because if we don't try harder to find these stories, we, we end up sort of, we reclaim some of, queer history, but it's like a whitewashed version, right? Like, yeah, the, the people that everybody knows about that, that are most surprising sound like uh, William Shakespeare and Abraham Lincoln and Eleanor Roosevelt. But yeah, let's look at Gandhi and let's look at Mempo Nathunia and let's look at Bayard Rustin. It's not just a white thing. It's not just an American thing. This is across time and around our world. You know, when I first told people about your book, some of them said to me, well, why does it matter whether someone was gay or not? I mean, if we're all equal, sexual orientation should be irrelevant. So Lee, how do you explain to those people, what is the value and importance of knowing that some of the most iconic figures in history were actually gay? It can mean, it can change everything. I, I feel like if you know that you're, that you have a legacy, I think it makes you feel more secure in knowing that you have a place at the table today. And especially for young people to know that they deserve a place at the table today lets them know that their future can be anything. And I think when, they're, when they reclaim that history, there's a sense of pride. And not that everybody queer in history was a wonderful person, but just the fact that we actually have a history 
is incredibly powerful. And when we're talking about self-esteem, I feel like it can make all the difference in the world. Well, let's face it, Lee, the kind of historical information you've provided in your book and in your blogs is not being taught in high school history classes, is it? It is not. In fact, my daughter just is graduating high school and her high school textbooks look pretty much exactly like my high school textbooks back in the 80s. In fact, it's so frustrating because we went to a back to school night and I you know, raised my hand and I asked the teacher, I'm like, you know, what, what gives with, with the history book? Like, how are our kids going to learn about women and people of color and disabled people and queer people too? Like, and, and the teacher was like, oh, well, yeah, I, I have a lot of supplemental materials I'm going to do. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not really sufficient. Supplemental materials are going to be seen as like, well, supplemental, like not really that important. It didn't make it in the textbook. So yeah, it would be really cool to have, uh, to have No Way They Were Gay be a textbook. You wrote in your book that learning about the people you wrote about forever changed your view of history. And because of that, your idea of your place in the world as a gay man. What did you mean by that? I think it goes back to that in my inner teen, like letting my inner teen know that, hey, it's okay. You're not the only one. There's a healing that happened in, in, in researching this book for me. And it got me really excited because I think that any one of these stories, if going back to that time machine, any one of these stories, any one of the 12 chapters, even one of the paragraphs in the introduction, it would have completely opened my eyes and made me recognize that I wasn't alone and I think that would have been such a gift. And to kind of let myself know now, hey, it's okay. You felt alone, but you were never alone. There's a lot of, there's a lot of power in that. I think so too. It sure would have helped me. Now you've mentioned that in your view, uh, the people, even queer people who believe that gay pride started with the Stonewall riots in New York in 1969, that that's not really accurate because there was a form of gay pride earlier than that. What did your research show? Oh, okay. So one of the mind, so the, the organizing element of the book is me being surprised because I was so surprised again and again. And probably the biggest surprise for me was learning about Sappho. Um, now, not that the word Sappho, I, I had heard of Sappho, you know, famous poet. I, I knew that she was a woman who loved other women because frankly, that's where we get the word sapphic. Um, in fact, the word lesbian comes from the island of Lesbos where Sappho lived. Like I kind of knew a little bit about it, but I had no idea that our entire culture is based on an idea that Sappho came up with. Back when Sappho lived, there was this idea that the most beautiful thing in the world is, is sort of this male expression of power, uh, a fleet of, an armada of ships, uh, a bunch of you know, soldiers on horses and infantry soldiers walking in, an, in, a, in a parade, like that was seen as the height of the most important, the most beautiful thing in the world. And Sappho wrote this one poem, and because she was a woman that loved other women, there was a lot of efforts throughout the, the centuries to sort of destroy her writings, but we do have some that have survived. There's, we have this one nearly intact poem where she talks about how she knows that the most beautiful thing in the world isn't an army or a fleet of ships or soldiers marching by. It's the face of the woman she loves flashing radiant. And because Sappho loved this woman, Anactoria, she wrote this poem and then that poem really captured the imagination of people and it resonated. And they were like, yeah, well, that's how I feel. I feel like love is the most important thing too. And that traveled throughout the centuries and even though we sort of lost the fact that it was connected to Sappho loving this woman, Anactoria, the reason that like in Sleeping Beauty, the, the kiss of true love breaks the evil spell, the reason that all those movies, those popular movies end with, you know, an expression of true love being the most powerful thing of all, we all believe it. But none of us really know that it comes from Sappho and it comes because Sappho was a woman that loved another woman. And that I think, uh, history starts to open up, right? Do you have a personal favorite hero from recent history? Yeah, Bayard Rustin. I, researching the book, I was just so blown away by... Uh, Bayard was openly gay 
He was black. He was a leader in the civil rights movement. He was the, the gentleman that taught Martin Luther King Jr. about the, the principles of nonviolent protest. And the more I read up from Bayard, the more amazed I became. And in fact, I had this personal connection because I went to the University of Pennsylvania and while I was there, I was so closeted and I didn't even know there was a gay group on, on campus. And while I was there in 1986, Bayard came to speak to that gay group. I didn't know. And, and in fact, I was able to put uh, one of the quotes from his speech into the book and it's so powerful. And what's crazy is that it was from 1986, but it reads like it was written today. If I can, I'm just gonna share a little bit of it. So in 1986, Bayard said this in a speech, the job of the gay community is not to deal with extremists who would castrate us or put us on an island and drop an H-bomb on us. The fact of the matter is there is a small percentage of people in America who understand the true nature of the homosexual community. There's another small percentage who will never understand us. Our job is not to get those people who dislike us to love us, nor was our aim in the civil rights movement to get prejudiced white people to love us. Our aim was to try to create the kind of America legislatively, morally, and psychologically such that even though some whites continue to hate us, they could not openly manifest that hate. That's our job today, to control the extent to which people can publicly manifest anti-gay sentiment. It's powerful. Feels, yeah, and it's exactly what we're dealing with here in America, where suddenly after four years of, of Trump, people feel like they can publicly manifest their hate. And we need to tell them, no, that is not cool. You can, if you're gonna be a racist, do it in the inside your mind, but don't do it out in the world. And similarly for, for homophobic. And, and for transphobic, there's a rash of anti-trans laws happening now, again, in America that are a completely cynical attempt to sort of like create a scapegoat and blame parts of the queer community. Obviously, the people you wrote about are people we should be proud of. Are there any LGBTQ figures from history that you're not proud of? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, like anything history is complicated and people are complicated. And there were some pretty horrible people in history that were queer too. And I think that if you cherry pick history and you're only like, here are the awesome people that were queer, it creates this false picture. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the person cherry picking from history. I want to be like, look, this person was kind of an awful person, but they're in part of our history too. They're part of our legacy. And we should acknowledge that. Like not everybody in history was perfect and that's okay. But, but we also need to recognize that there were reasons behind certain things. So there's a chapter on uh, the Lieutenant Nunn. Um, this was a person who was born Catalina de Arraso. They were raised in a convent in Spain in 1600. They escaped the convent and then they dressed as a man and they basically ran off to Central America to become a soldier and a lover of women, you know, who went by a ton of pseudonyms and then was part of the horrible colonization where they decimated, you know, in wars, the native people. And they sort of embodied as a man, all the worst, most toxic masculine elements of, of what it meant to be a man in, in 1600s. This idea that like everybody else is backwards and every culture that they encountered was on a, a, a journey to evolve, to be more like them, but because they hadn't evolved yet or they were a different skin color or whatever, they didn't matter. And so they could be, you know, their land could be stolen, their, they could be murdered, they could be enslaved. And the Lieutenant Nunn really bought into it. And even though they weren't born with a man's body, they claimed a man's privilege. And when they were, they murdered a few people. And in fact, at one point when they were caught for a murder, they confessed that they weren't, that they were actually born a woman. And I use they because we have no idea how they actually viewed their own gender, but that confession led to them becoming really famous. And they published an autobiography, which I quote uh, uh, quite a bit from uh, in the book. And it's a fascinating story of someone born with a woman's body that decides that they are going to claim male privilege and live a life as a man. And then they meet the Pope. I mean, they really became a celebrity and they were kind of a horrible person. 
but it's fascinating. Yeah, not everybody that's queer is going to be awesome. There have been a lot of movies and TV shows over the years that have dealt with homosexuality, homo lovuality. Do you have any favorites that you think have done a good job of providing young people with positive role models? I remember watching the first season of Glee and cringing every time Kurt came on the screen because when I was growing up, there were all these stereotypes about what it meant to be gay. And I honestly felt like Kurt did a really great job as a character of embodying most of those stereotypes, <laughs> sort of like swishy and singing with a really high voice and just incredibly effeminate. And I had, it just triggered so much of my own internalized homophobia because I thought like, this is the one gay teen character on television. And it felt like it was so weighty, like he had, he had to be perfect. And, and he wasn't in my mind. But then like two seasons in, suddenly there are like five main queer people, uh, characters on Glee. And at that point, it didn't matter. I mean, there was Blaine, there was Santana, there were so many ways of being gay. And I just, it didn't matter anymore. Kirk could be as flamboyant as he wanted to be because he wasn't the gay. He was just a gay. So I am thrilled for every representation in media of queer people because the more there are, the less weight each one has. And I mean, I'm not thrilled when it's like the, you know, the trans person is the murderer or something. Like, I think there are certain stereotypical tropes that media can reinforce and I'd like us to move away from those. But I think that there's power in numbers and, you know, getting a quorum, getting enough representation so each one isn't so weighted with power. You've created a new acronym in the book. Instead of saying LGBTQIA2+, you suggest the term quilt bag. Can you explain that term for us and why you're suggesting that we use it? Sure. I didn't actually come up with quilt bag, but I do like the idea of rearranging the letters and sort of taking white men out of the spotlight. Uh, well, not that everybody gay is white, but just men get so much privilege. So to have it start out with Q for queer and, um, you know, and progress through U for unidentified and I for intersex and L for lesbian and T for trans and B for bi and A for asexual and then G for gay, it just feels like, oh, we're adding a little bit of balance back and it's pronounceable. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I just don't want people calling me an old quilt bag. <laughs> My father actually really loved quilt bag. And he said that to me, he said that to him, it felt like a, a quilt, like, like how wonderful as a metaphor, a, a quilt of all these different people coming together. And actually that made me hear it in a different way as well. You know, Lee, a lot of people may not be aware that gay and lesbian youth are five times more likely to attempt suicide than heterosexual youth. And 40% of transgender adults have reported that they've attempted suicide. Those statistics really hit home for me because I was one of those young gay men who attempted suicide when my parents rejected me after I came out to them when I was 19. What do you have to say to someone who may be contemplating suicide? Oh. Well, first of all, Harvey, let me just say that, that I'm so sorry that you, that you had such pain and that you weren't accepted for who you are. And I'm so glad you're here with us. And, and I was very moved by the whole, it gets better movement. I, I thought that having queer adults speaking directly to youth and letting them know like, hey, it may totally suck now. And I remember how terrible junior high was and high school, but it does get better. I, I feel like hang in there. I mean, that you're not alone. Contact the Trevor Project, find somebody to talk to. And I'm not a therapist, but there are good queer affirming therapists out there. I think that it can feel so overwhelming. And to know that it's, life is bigger than that. We study Romeo and Juliet in high school, right? And it's like these two these teens, that think that the world is over and we're just the damn apothecary, have faith that it can get better. And one of the ways it can get better really is for us adults. Like we have a job to do. We have to 
message to young people that we accept them, that we see them, that we celebrate them. We have this crazy thing in our culture where we're like, let's teach tolerance. Tolerating something is not the same as embracing it, is not the same as celebrating it. And we need to celebrate differences and celebrate our youth. And, you know, for the parents listening, when a parent rejects a child, that puts that child in such danger. But for everyone else, every time there is a safe adult in a kid's life, it is, there is a protective measure that that child has. And the more safe adults they can have, the better, all, the better their outcomes are. So I think a lot about how like, there's, no such thing, there's no such thing as a silent ally. You can't say in your mind, oh, I, I'm, I'm an ally to queer people. And then nobody knows it. That, that makes you a bystander. That doesn't make you an ally. You have to stand up and, and do things. And there are really little things that we can all do, like adding your pronouns after your name on your email signature, or when you do a Zoom call. You know, that signals that people, that you know that people shouldn't assume your pronouns or your gender based on your name or your appearance. It lets people know that you don't assume about their gender based on their name or their appearance. And it also lets them know that if they are trans or gender queer, or gender fluid or intersex, uh, that you're a safe person. Teachers can put up safe space stickers, like podcast hosts can have someone on to talk about queer issues. Like there are so many little ways that each of us as an adult can be that safe person. And just think of the ripple effect, right? Like if, if more and more of us are safe people, then there won't be so many kids feeling like they have no one to turn to. Well, you quoted civil rights activist Bayard Rustin in your book. He said, and I'm quoting here, if we want to do away with injustice to gays, it will only be done when we eliminate injustice for all. We can't leave anyone behind. That's such a powerful message, isn't it? It's one of the reasons Bayard became my hero in writing this book, because I feel like as a gay man, being the G of, of quilt bag, my job is to be an ally to everybody else. And then beyond the queer community, my job is to be an ally to women and people of color and disabled people and uh, indigenous people. Like that's, that's my gig on this, on this earth. I want to, how can I stand up, not be a bystander and just in my mind think, oh yeah, I want to support them, but how well, can I actually do it? There's another quote from your book that really resonated with me. You wrote, being authentic about who you feel yourself to be and who you are attracted to is not a lifestyle, it's a life. Lee, I'm so glad you said that because I actually resent the use of the word lifestyle to describe my sexual orientation. A lifestyle is largely something you choose, but my sexual orientation is simply part of who I am. Absolutely. The only choice we have as queer people is, are we going to be authentic or are we going to lie? That's our choice. And I do find those words really triggering when people are like, oh, you're like, I, I, I respect your lifestyle choice. No, please stop. Don't. No, it's not a choice. <laughs> my, my daughter had long hair for quite a while. Having long hair is a lifestyle choice. But being queer, being, being a guy who loves another guy or a, a woman who loves another woman or feeling like it doesn't matter to you what gender someone is, you can fall in love with them. Like that, that is not a choice. And also your gender identity, like who you believe yourself to be in your core, that is not a choice. That, like we have to respect that. Well, Lee, it's been a real pleasure to have you come on our show. You know, we can't turn back the clock and make life easier for all of us who had to come to terms with our sexual orientation on our own. But it warms my heart to know that young people today don't have to feel so alone and marginalized and stigmatized. At least that's my hope. So thank you so much, Lee, for everything you're doing to empower young people. And thanks so much for coming on our show. It's totally been my pleasure. Thank you, Harvey. Our guest has been author and blogger Lee Wind. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.